today's video, I'm going to take a look at a new camera I've bought for the channel. So yep, after far too long, I'm finally going 4K. For a good few years now, I've been using my old Sony A6000 camera, and I've had this since I think 2016 I bought it. And then before that, I was using an ancient JVC camcorder that was 1080i, so I've literally gone 1080i to 1080p with this camera, and then now I'm going to 4K. So yeah, I've had this camera since 2016, and it's a really nice little, nice little mirrorless camera, and it still works perfectly. At the time that I bought it, I had plans, you know, I was like, I'll, I'll get a mirrorless camera and I can get all different lenses for it and I can put a lot of effort in and do all sorts of fancy cin cinematic stuff. And ultimately I got it the kit lens and I've never put another lens on it. So when it came to looking at new cameras, obviously I was considering other mir mirrorless ones because that's just the sort of go-to option nowadays for YouTube. But I was really thinking and I was looking going, I've not changed the lens on this camera ever. Am I ever going to change the lens again if I buy another mirrorless? And the answer was probably no. The sort of content I produce, I really just need something that's point and shoot. So I took a look at camcorders. Because it's been a long time since I really looked at camcorders, you know, back when I previously dealt with them, I was just using little sort of consumer ones, the ones you sort of film your kids' sports day with, that sort of thing. And obviously they've kind of died, they're dying out now because people just use their phones. But there's still quite a lot of camcorders available in the sort of professional and sort of prosumer sort of market. And that's really what I looked at. And it looked really promising. There's a lot of options out there, but what I felt with them is you get a camera that's got a good lens, it's optimised for video, it has audio inputs on board, and it'll just kind of work as like a point and shoot option. Whereas with this camera, currently I've got quite a lot of settings to change, I need to use an external audio recorder, so I need to lug this entire setup around just to get sound to work. And it is just a lot fiddlier than having a camcorder. Plus if I want to do handheld work, which I do sometimes do, with this camera, it's really hard to hold, so I do have a gimbal for it, which is great, but half the time I wanted to film something handheld, I just can't be bothered getting the gimbal out, setting it up, and then putting the camera on it. So I end up just holding the camera in my hand, and it ends up all shaky. Whereas a camcorder has decent stabilisation, and is generally easier to handle. So yeah, what we're doing in this video is we'll take a look at what I've gone for, talk about why I went for it, and then we'll take a look at it and try it out. Now, what I will say with this, just to be very clear off the bat, is that I am not a photography expert and I'm not a videographer. So if you're coming to this video and you've not seen my channel before and you're wanting like a super in-depth review of this camera that goes into all the details with like cinematic test footage, this won't really be the video for you because, I, I mean, I know the basics, but I don't really know enough to give a full in-depth review of it. However, what this video could be useful for is really just sort of to show my experience as someone who's used a mirrorless camera for years, who's now going to this camcorder, really just to see how I feel about it and whether it is worth buying, more, buying camcorders for things like this rather than mirrorless cameras, or is a mirrorless camera still a better option? So as you can see here, I went for the Panasonic HC-X1500, which is a fairly new model that they introduced at the start of 2020. And it's, in, it's one of their sort of high-end high prosumer, entry-level professional type camcorders they've introduced. And it's introduced as part of a range of three different cameras. You've got the HCX1500, the HCX2000, and the AGCX10. So the X1500 is the most entry-level one in that range, and that costs £1,449. I paid closer to £1,250 for this in a Black Friday sale, but round about £1,449. The X2000 is then £1,849 and that was the one I almost went for because when you're flicking through a website and you're seeing the pictures you can see that the X2000 comes with a handle on top and XLR inputs whereas this one doesn't. However I did a bit more research into it and what I also found is that not only does the X2000 contain the handle it also has an SDI output and that's the only difference between the X2000 and this is it comes with a handle and an SDI output. I like the handle because I want the, X the XLR inputs and you know it's nice to handle it with, but I don't need an SDI output. But it turns out you can actually buy the handle separately. So you can buy the handle as the VWHU1 and that costs £239, which is quite a lot of money for a handle and XLR input. But what that means is if I put these two things together, I'll pay in total £1,688, which is about £160 cheaper than the X2000, and literally the only difference is that I won't have an SDI output, which I really don't need. 
So that's important to bear in mind if you're buying these. If you're flicking through the cameras and looking at the pictures, if you just want the handle and the XLR inputs, you're likely to be much cheaper off buying the 1500 with a handle than buying the X2000 and then ending up with an SDI output you don't need. The final camera in the range is the AGCX10. You'll notice that's AG at the start rather than HC. That's because whereas this is kind of pushed through Panasonic's consumer channels, the AG is pushed through their professional broadcast channels that is marketed with the higher end broadcast cameras. Ultimately, it's essentially the same camera as the X2000. The only difference is that it supports their P2MXF recording format, which is a broadcast format, using special micro P2 cards that are just, they seem to just be really expensive SD cards. But you need to use a special card and it'll do that broadcast codec. And it also supports Ethernet using a USB to Ethernet adapter for live streaming. This one also supports live streaming, but it, it can only do it over Wi-Fi. So if you go to the CX10, you get Ethernet. But that camera costs 2,300, 2, so it's a lot more money. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need SDI. I don't need P2MXF because I'm not paying hundreds for an SD card. And I don't really need Ethernet. So this seems like the best value option. When I was buying this, I was comparing it to a couple of other options. Obviously, I was comparing it to mirrorless options as well. But in the camcorder range, I was comparing it to the Canon XA40 and the Panasonic HCX1. The HCX1 looked cool and I kind of wanted it just because it's a much bigger camera and looks very like a serious professional broadcast camera, just because it's a much bigger camera. And it does have a larger sensor, it's got a one inch sensor, whereas this is quite a small sensor. But the X1's a much older camera, so it doesn't support the modern codecs, it doesn't support 10 bit recording and stuff like that, so it's a bit more outdated. And ultimately, as cool as the big camera is, I found myself going to attics and under floors of houses filming before, so a smaller camera is probably useful. The XA40 was also tempting, but it just didn't have the sort of the higher end 10 bit recording and stuff that this one has, so this just seemed like a better option. So, yeah, what we'll now do is we'll unbox it all, take a look at it, talk about the specs, and then we'll try it out. So, now before we open it up, let's talk about some of the specs. So, as I mentioned, this is a Panasonic HCX1500, and obviously it's a 4K camcorder. But the box doesn't have all the information, so just to go through some a few other specs. It has an 8.3 megapixel, 1 over 2.5 inch sensor. So the sensor is comparatively small compared to other cameras. Some of the higher end camcorders, when you're going into the large broadcast type ones, they have 1 inch sensors, which might be a bit better in low light. The camera I'm using here has an APS-C sensor, which is miles bigger than this. The sensor is obviously way smaller than all the mirrorless cameras. I mean, the sensor is kind of the size you'd find in some high end phones. It's a very small sensor. So that does mean you're not going to get amazing low light performance. If I needed low light performance, I would you know, still want to get a mirrorless camera. But ultimately, I'll keep my mirrorless camera. I'm not going to get rid of this one at all. So if I do end up in a situation where I really need low light, I can still use my A6000. But obviously, when I'm filming here, I'm under big studio light, so I really don't need the low light performance. And the one thing I've seen online, and I'm not an expert, remember, that apparently this, the smaller sensor does also give is it gives a much wider depth of field. So with the small sensor in this camera, you're not going to get that really sort of narrow depth of field effect you get with a lot of DSLR photography. So for example, if I put my hand in front of the camera, you'll see it'll autofocus the background will blur out. That sort of shallow depth of field. This won't do as easily. And for some people, that's a disadvantage. But for me, that honestly could be an advantage because it's one downside I find with this camera because it's got a very large sensor and a fairly wide aperture lens, I think the word is. So what it means is because it's got quite a shallow depth of field, sometimes if I've got a large item on this table I'm trying to film, because of the angle I film at, you'll end up with the front of the thing in focus and the back of it out of focus. You might even see it a little bit on this box, whereas this here is very in focus and the Panasonic logo at the back is a bit out of focus. So actually having a wider depth of field on this new camera could actually be very beneficial because it'll make focusing stuff a lot easier and I won't have to constantly have focus hunting around. Like I hold something up to the camera and have to wait for the focus to turn and then go back and wait for the focus to move back. So it's just something to bear in mind. The smaller sensor means it'll potentially have worse low light performance, but it'll also have a wider depth of field, which could be beneficial. Now the lens on this is what's really interesting because obviously this doesn't have interchangeable lenses, whereas my current camera does. So that could be a disadvantage. But the benefit of this is that you're getting a very good lens built in. They're not including a cheap kit lens or you're having to then buy a really expensive lens for a mirrorless camera. 
nor are you having to buy a lot of different lenses to do, do different things. This has a pretty good looking lens in it, and it's a very flexible, powerful lens. So the lens in this camera has a 35mm equivalent focal length of 25mm to 600mm. So that's really wide at the sort of widest angle, but that can zoom in really far. That's a 24 times optical zoom. So that's really good, just having that flexibility. Whereas my current camera's kit lens is 16mm to 50mm, which is, that's the APS-C focal length, so the 35mm equivalent of that is 24mm to 75mm. So at its widest, it's about the same as my current camera, but as it's most zoomed in, it's, it'll zoom in a lot further. And yes, I'm totally butchering on the camera terminology here because I really i am not an expert. But yes, yeah, so the lens on this has a much wider focal length. And in terms of the aperture, this lens is f1.8 to f4.0. So obviously if that sort of lens was on my current mirrorless camera, you'd have a really, really shallow depth of field. But because of the smaller sensor, you won't have that sort of f1.8 really shallow depth of field. But it does mean it's quite a wide sort of a wide aperture lens, so it's it should be quite good in low light. So that's all the sort of optic stuff, which again, not an expert in. But what I can talk about is the recording formats because I understand that sort of stuff. So one of the good things with this camera is it supports HEVC or H.265, which is something my current camera doesn't support. So I'll be able to record at higher quality for, at the same bit rates and deal with smaller files and stuff like that. So having a much more modern codec is really, really good. The other good thing this camera supports is full 10-bit recording, and that massively sets it apart from other cameras around this price point. With 10-bit recording, you just get that extra information in the file. So if you're doing any sorts of colour grading after the fact, it's a lot easier. You've got a lot more information to work with. And I'm hoping this helps here, because I've had occasional issues before where there's like a gradient on this back wall from the way the lighting works. And I've had a lot of issues with colour banding with my current camera, where you end up with quite ugly compress compression artefacting lines and stuff on the wall, just because of how the 8-bit camera deals with gradients. And even if it doesn't, just having that additional information there for adjusting colours is going to be really good. At 4K60, this can record with a chroma subsampling of 420, but if you drop that down to 4K30, it can actually record at full 422 chroma subsampling internally, which is really, really good, because a lot of cameras don't do that. They require external recorders to do 422. I'm not an expert in chroma subsampling, so if you find a video on that, it explains it a lot better. But essentially, 422 just has a lot more colour information in it. I think it's twice as much colour information, so that can be a bit better if you're trying to colour grade and things like that. And while I haven't tested it, obviously, I mean, I've obviously not tested it, it's still in the box, but apparently it can record full 4K60 at 422 if you use an external recorder. So it can output 4K60, 422 over HDMI, and you can use an external recorder to capture that. So that's really good. Obviously, I don't currently know which format I'll work with. I don't know what the file sizes will be like, how bearable it'll be, it'll be to edit. But it gives me the flexibility. I can try all the different formats and encodings out and see how I feel and just see, see what works. But it's good to have that flexibility. And then obviously, it'll also do full HD because, of course, it will. But if you drop it into full HD, this can do 120 frames a second. So that's really good as well. So if you want to get some nice slow-mo stuff, sure, you have to drop the resolution a bit, but then you get a really good slow-mo camera. So... Yeah, it seems really, really flexible. So yeah, that's all the specs. Now, I know I've been rambling for a very long time, so let's just get into this thing, and then I'll talk about some more specs while we're actually looking at the camera. But I really just want to get this out of the box and start playing with it. So, yeah, we've got the box here, just fairly generic sort of packaging. It's quite a big box, and it weighs quite a bit, so I think it's going to be quite a big camera. Um, but hopefully not un too unwieldy. But let's just get into this and see what we get. It's been sitting here all day and I've been desperate to actually take it out of the box, but the problem is when you're doing videos and you're like, you want to unbox it and stuff on camera and do like genuine first impressions, you have to sit at looking, in, looking at things in boxes because you can't take them out to play with them before you film it. But yeah, let's see what we get. So that's it there. Got a box of accessories. We'll just take a quick look and see what we get with it. So you get a power brick. That's fine, just a sort of barrel jack on there. You get a pair of figure of eight cables, just a EU and a UK one, so that's fine. You get an eye cup for the viewfinder. And then you get, what I presume is a battery. 
Yep, you got a battery and that's pretty chunky big battery on there. That's pretty good. I don't see any sort of external battery or battery charger, but I presume that just means you'll charge the battery in the camera. And this is something I also quite like about the idea of having a camcorder. Obviously I haven't tested it, but I would be I very much expect that you can run this camera off the mains and you know plug it in and it'll just charge its battery internally, which is something I can't do with this current camera. If you plug a USB cable into the side of it, it will go into like computer mode even if it's plugged into a charger and won't let you run the camera off the mains. And to do that, so if you want to do that, Sony charge you quite a lot to buy this sort of fake battery that goes in the bottom of it. And then you need to charge the batteries on an external charger. So as I'm filming this, I've got a, I've got a spare battery on an external charger so I can swap the batteries every time they die. So being able to actually just plug the camera in if it runs low on battery is quite good. But yeah, you've got the battery and your charger there. And they do obviously sell external chargers for these batteries, it just doesn't come with one. You get the world's biggest pile of instruction manuals. That, that is honestly quite a lot of the weight of that box. There's like, presumably there's a lot of different languages in there. And then finally under here, we are going to get the camera itself. So that's in there. There's also a lot of free space because, yeah, you can see there's obviously space in there for the, if you're buying the X2000 for where the handle would be in, turn, in, the, in the box, but there is the camera. Weighs a fair bit in the sense that it feels solid, but doesn't feel, weigh too much in the sense it's going to be inconvenient. So let's get that box out of the way and we'll unwrap it. So that's the camera there. <laughs> see if I drop this for the first time. Right, there it is. And... There it is. So, yep, that is my new camera. So, yep, it definitely feels very, very big. That's the biggest camcorder I've ever used. Um, but it doesn't feel too inconvenient. It's just chunky. So, yep, that's the camera there. And there's all the accessories. So you get the camera, the battery, the charger, or power brick, and then a couple of mains leads, and the iCup, which will go on the viewfinder on the end. So yeah, that's what you get in the box. So of course we've got the other accessory, so now let's get it out of the way. And what we now need to take a look at is the handle and get that on the camera. So, yep. And this is obviously something you only really get with the sort of higher end professional camcorders, you know. You can get a camcorder like that for a lot cheaper than this one. But if you want this sort of, I suppose, 10 bit recording, but also the ability to use things like a handle, this is sort of where you need these higher end cameras. So get it out of the way, give it the handle. And if we take that out, you'll see what we get. And there we go. So that's the handle. It feels a little bit plasticky, but it's fine. It's not bad at all. I think it's also it was more because also because it's got this loose bit, so it feels rattly until that's screwed down. But yep, that's the handle. So we can see here that gives you the audio controls there, XLR jacks on this side here to connect microphones to, so I can connect my microphone straight into the camera, which is the other reason I went for this. And then on the front you've got a light, so yep, you've even got a light built in, which I mean, part of me thinks oh, that's a bit of a gimmick, you know, I remember years ago having an old Sony Hi8 Hi Handycam that had a built-in light, but to be honest, I can see it being useful. Just to, say you're filming someone outside at night, and you just want a bit of light on their face, you can use that. You know, say if you put them on those, like, additional LED panels on top of the camera, having that built in. Or I'm thinking myself, where I've been, like, filming in like an attic and I end up crawling along, along with a torch because I didn't fancy taking my big video lights up there. Having this built in is quite nice. So yeah, you get a light, little light as well. And obviously on the top there's control for the lights, on, off, and record, zoom, stuff like that. So yeah. And what I've also noticed is that on the handle you've got a cold shoe and a sort of tripod thread mount, which replicates what's on top of the camera as well. The camera's also got a cold shoe and a tripod screw mount. So that means that if, even if you put the handle on top of the camera, you don't lose the ability to mount things on it. In particular, you could use this to fit, mount additional lights, you could put microphones on here, you could use this to, the tripod mount to put an additional monitor on top of the camera. So there's decent mounting options. And the other thing I actually forgot to show is you get a microphone mount. So if you wanted to fit some sort of shotgun mic on top of this camera, you can. You would take this little adapter here, it comes with a couple of screws. You put that into the side there, and you can mount a shotgun mic in there and have it hang off the top of the camera. And I'm actually going to use this, not for a shotgun mic though, but for my existing microphone. Because you might have seen it before, but I 
my current microphone is a Sony ECM77B, which is a really, really good lavalier microphone. But the problem is it's phantom powered, but it also has the option of putting a AA battery in here to power the microphone. And because of that, you end up with this stupid big long XLR connector hanging off the camera or hanging off the microphone. And in addition, they've got a Fethead Phantom preamp just to get better audio quality. So you end up with this like comically long thing that hangs off the audio recorder and it ends up falling and getting tangled in things and has to hang off stuff, if I'm, especially if I'm not filming at a table. It's a nightmare to deal with. But that's kind of shotgun mic shaped. So what I'm going to actually try and do is mount this into the shotgun mic holder just so I can have my entire microphone just attached to the camera physically. So all I'll have is just the thin mic wire coming off the camera and it'll be one thing that I can carry around. I no longer have to juggle audio recorders and clip this on my belt if I'm trying to move around. So yeah, this should be quite useful. So yep, we've got the camera, the thing, uh, the mic holder and the handle. So this can all go together. So I'll assemble it off camera, but I think, I think ultimately that'll just clip in there and then that'll screw down. And what's actually quite nice up here is obviously this has the connector that goes into the camera and the camera's got this like cover over the hole and that just kind of is spring loaded. So that just spring loads down for that to connect in. But it means if you've not got the handle, that springs up and it kind of just seals the top of the camera so you're not going to get any dust or anything in there into the connector. And this being removable as well is quite nice because it also means that if you don't need the external microphone and you need something a lot lighter, you can actually take this handle off and end up with a smaller camera. Whereas with the bigger ones like the X1, the handle's very much integrated into the camera. You couldn't just take it off to make a smaller camera. So yeah, time to go and assemble this off camera and I'll come back and we'll take a look at it. Okay, so that's it all put together. Now, I'll obviously need to go away and use it properly to give my full review of it. So I'll do that after this clip. I'll go away, try it out, and I'll come back at the end of the video and talk about it. But yeah, first impressions are pretty good. Definitely feels like a very solid bit of kit and it's definitely pretty big. It's not like uncomfortably big. You can easily hold a hand sort of handheld, but you probably wouldn't want to hold this up for hours on end. It, it will weigh on your arm a little bit. And yeah, it looks pretty big, but then especially when you compare it to other camcorders. So here we have my old JVC. This is the old GZHD3 I sort of, sort of started filming with when I sort of came back to YouTube. This thing drove me absolutely mad because it's 1080i and trying to work with that footage was a pain. But yeah, there's quite a size difference there. And then if you compare it to this little Panas another Panasonic Full HD camcorder, well, there's, there's quite a size difference between the two of them. You know, you, you can basically fit that in the handle. It's, it's yeah, quite a big size difference. But it's not impossibly, impossibly bulky. And like having that handle on top will make it really good. So yeah, pretty happy with it. Now in terms of the overall build quality, it is pretty good, but it just feels maybe a little bit plasticky. You know, it's all plastic and it just, some, some like little seams in the edges on the plastic are maybe a bit rough. It's not bad at all. It's just a little bit more plasticky than I thought it would be. Now, admittedly, my current camera is a really nice Sony that's got a lot of metal on the casing and stuff, so, you know, it, it will feel different. But yeah, maybe a little bit plasticky. And I think the only thing I've really noticed is it feels like a sort of plastic. In fact, similar to my audio recorder, where it can kind of mark kind of easily. So if we open up this, like, shotgun mic holder, you can see there's already, like, a slightly shiny piece there where this is clamped down. So I feel like maybe if you're, for example... And say you had like a monitor on the top here that you're regularly screwing on and off, you might end up with a bit of like sort of shininess around that hole. So yeah, a little bit plasticky, but doesn't feel terrible. I maybe wouldn't use it to do like a news report from a war zone. It might not be good for that. But yeah, it seems okay. It's just a little bit plasticky, but it feels very substantial. Definitely feels pretty good. It does also have nice things like this shotgun holder, because this is very much shock, shock mounted. So under there, you can see there's little rubber sort of washers and that gives it a lot of play and then when you open this up the microphone has also got really nice sort of like squishy damp dampers so the microphone will be very much isolated from the camera plus having that play there also means if it ever gets knocked or bashed it's not going to break off and putting it together was pretty easy, easy all clipped together the only thing you needed to do was use a screwdriver to put these two screws in so that's just worth bearing in mind but yeah pretty happy with it Definitely feels a very solid bit of kit, which is nice. So now before I go and turn it on and try it out, we'll do a quick tour of it. So 
obviously on the side of the camera, you can see, well, on the front, you've got the main lens and it's got the shutter over it that opens with this switch here. So you flick that switch and that opens. So that's really nice, especially compared to the current camera where the lens cap, I just lo keep losing the lens cap and I never use it because I keep losing it. It's nice having that built in. You've then got two sort of two built-in rings. These are electronic, they're not mechanical. So that ring doesn't, you know, change the actual lens mechanically. It is electronic. So that can be a disadvantage in the sense that it, you've not got, you know, actual tactile manual control. But on the other hand, these are then configurable. I think you can change one of them to either do focus or iris. I can't remember. You can kind of change the options of these, which is quite good. Next up, you've got the ND filters. So this is a real benefit that you have in camcorders, where the, well, the higher end ones have built in neutral density filters. So what these do is they just literally let you just physically using an optical element, reduce the amount of light going into the camera. So if you're in bright sunlight, you can essentially use that to darken the footage slightly. And it's really good having that built in, you, you know, with a camera like mine, like a mirrorless, you'd have to physically buy them and change them on the lenses. Whereas just having an option you can just set there, it's pretty neat. I probably won't use them much because obviously I film indoors, but it's good to have them. Then you've also got a bunch of controls. So you've got buttons here for iris, gain, and shutter. This is something to bear in mind that because it's a camcorder, it tends to use video terminology rather than photography terminology. So basically iris is the aperture, I think. Gain is the ISO and shutter is just the shutter speed. So they use some slightly different words, but that's basically fine. Menu, iris, switch between auto and manual. It's all fairly simple. And yeah, the buttons are like a little bit mushy. They're not that clicky, but they seem okay. And there's a knob there obviously to navigate the menus. Just other, a few other things before we look inside the screen. Battery goes in the bottom, just clips in there. Now this is the one sort of downside of this camera over a lot of other camcorders. Because even if you look at say the old one, my old one here, the battery is on the back of this and it sticks out the back like that. And that means that if you need extended battery life, you can get super deep batteries that can stick out miles from the camera. They almost look sort of comical sometimes, but you can get really, really good runtime. Even this little cheap consumer thing has that, you, you know, the battery clips on the back and can stick out as far as you want. Whereas with this one, they've rotated the battery so it actually sticks out the bottom. So you basically, this is basically the biggest battery you can put in this camera. You, you can't put bigger batteries in. It's an interesting decision. I don't know for sure, but I suspect maybe this battery is one that they use in all of their high-end camcorders. So they maybe made the decision to say, right, put the normal battery, the standard battery in because people will already have them, rather than making a sort of different size of battery just for this camera. But it's not the end of the world. I mean, I'll probably plug this in most of the time, but it's just worth bearing in mind that if you are expecting to get a camcorder because you can put huge long batteries into it, with this one, you're limited to this size of battery. In terms of I.O., you've got on the back here, you've got your HDMI port under a little flap, a headphone output for monitoring the audio, and a DC barrel jack input, which also has a charge indicator under there. Record button, that feels pretty tactile though, which is good, so at least I won't be worried about not starting the recording. Then around the front, you've got more input, so you've got a 3.5mm microphone input, so you can actually connect a microphone to this if you don't buy the handle, but obviously I've got a high-end XLR microphone, so I want to use XLR, I don't want to be using a 3.5mm jack. You've got a connection for a remote there, that's if you want an external remote to control it. And then you've got a USB port for, I think that'll be for, um, I don't know, your USB port now. I think on the on the CX-10, that's where you connect that Ethernet adapter. But just looking at the port on that, that's like a, is it USB micro A or something? It's, it's not a standard USB B or micro USB. So that's worth bearing in mind actually that yeah, the USB port on it is, I think that's micro A. Now, it's not the end of the world. I mean, I, I, I would never use that. I would just take the SD card out. But yeah, if you're if you're planning on just plugging this into your computer with a USB cable to get the footage off rather than getting an SD card reader, you will need to get a cable for that because there isn't one in the box that I could see. But yeah, just something worth bearing in mind. And then obviously for the handle, you've got your two XLR inputs on the side here. And then you've got the audio controls around this side. Now, the audio controls are pretty good. There's a little cover over them to stop you accidentally flicking them. And essentially what you do, if you've got your two different audio channels, you can adjust the level and you can actually assign what goes to the channel. So you can say that on this, on the on channel one, you either send you either want that to be the left internal microphone or input one. And then on the second audio channel, you can say you either want it to be the right internal microphone, 
XLR1 or XLR2. Now that's going to be really useful for me because what that means is I can plug my microphone into say input one and say, right, I want channel one to be input one and that'll be my external microphone. But I can then say for channel two, I want to record the right channel of the internal microphone. And that means I'll have two simultaneous microphones recording. So if I need audio from in front of the camera, that'll have still been recorded. Or if there's an issue and my microphone fails or I, I tap it funny and I, need to, I can't use the audio from it, I can then use the audio from the internal microphone as a backup. And that is a big benefit over using the 3.5mm jack. Because I've seen a lot of videos or heard a lot of stories where someone say, they're filming on like a little, you know, a compact camera or a mirrorless that has a 3.5mm jack. And especially it happens when they're using wireless mics. They'll plug the wireless mic receiver into the camera, which disables the internal microphones, and then they forget to switch the wireless mic on or the battery dies, and they just end up with literally no audio. At least for me here, I can record my, internal, my external microphone and the internal mic, and even if I have an issue with the, inter with the external mic, I'll still at least have some sort of audio. So that's really good to have. There's other controls up here as well. So you can switch the, basically adjust the sort of input level. So you can either say it's a line level signal or a microphone signal, and you can switch on 48 volt phantom power if your microphone requires it, which mine does. So that's really good. And then you've got auto gain control or manual gain control. So you can say, put it manual, and then that presume that'll do the gain. And I presume if you set that as auto gain control, that just won't do anything. So yeah, this is a lot better than I would get with any sort of mirrorless camera, is just having this functionality. And what I found was actually quite amusing is Panasonic do sell an XLR adapter for, I think, their GH5 and S5 mirrorless cameras. And it looks literally like this. I think it is literally the same as this here, just without the handle and the light and stuff like that. But it costs about £100 more than this handle. So, yeah, you actually save, you, you're saving a lot buying this handle versus buying the adapter for mirrorless. But, yeah, that's a really nice little feature to have. And that'll be so much better than dealing with this external audio recorder and pile of cables and stuff. Because... I remember filming trying to crawl through an attic carrying this and it was an absolute nightmare. So yeah, having a, all the audio built in is going to be really, really nice. On top of the handle, you can see we have controls for the light. So it's just a simple potentiometer, just adjust the brightness and an on-off switch. Hold and, oh sorry, record with a hold switch so you can sort of stop that being pressed accidentally. And then there's a zoom control there as well. So if you're holding the camera down, you can use all the functionality. On the other side here, you can see we've got a proper zoom rocker, like a, well, this, is, this, is, this is a proper one as well, but this is a really solid one and it has a lot of travel. So this will give you really good fine grain control over the speed of zooming. So that's really, really good to have. So now let's take a look at some of the other buttons. Now I promise I'll turn it on eventually, but yep. So as you can see up here, we've got some buttons and you can see these two are labeled user one and user two. And you'll also notice other buttons have a number next to them. So OIS has a three next to it and AE level has a four next to it. And there's another one over here that's user five. These are all configurable buttons, that you, they're user configurable. So user one, user two, and user five are literally, you, you'll configure what they do. And then even though the OIS button and the AE level buttons are currently have those functions, I'm pretty sure you can go into the menus and change what these do. So you can kind of have like shortcut buttons, which is quite good. There's other button for white balance and stuff, nothing too exciting. The screen folds out like that and it's very, very nice. Very, very sort of articulated, does all that. Basically works exactly like you'd expect. It is touchscreen and it feels like, it's not, I don't think it's glass, but it feels pretty nice. It feels, it's definitely gonna be capacitive, which is good. Cause that was the other thing I think the Panasonic X1, it was a resistive touchscreen. So screen feels good. We'll see what it's like when it's on. But yeah, loads, loads of buttons seems pretty decent. And then the final thing we'll take a look at before we actually turn it on is the SD card readers. And yes, there's two of them. So there's a slot there that opens up. The lighting's not, be my friend here. But you can see there, you have two different SD card slots. So you put one card into each of them and there's a slot select button that picks what card is being used. And there's also a little LED that indicates which card is being used as well. And this is good for two different things. You can use this in two different ways. Either you can put two different cards in this for capacity. So it'll just keep recording and then one, when one card fills up, it'll, it'll start recording to the other card. And that means you could have really good long recording. So say you're filming some sort of live event where you cannot have the camera stop, that could be really useful. The other benefit is in terms of redundancy. If you're worried about a card failing, you could put one card into each slot and record to both cards so that in the unlikely event that a card does fail, you don't lose the footage. Now I might try that. I did actually pick up two different SD cards just because they were in the Black Friday sale for 20 quid each. So 
you weren't too bad. 128 gig UHS 2 cards. I've already got one of these, I'm actually recording to another card that's identical to this. And obviously this won't use UHS 2 to record, but it's so much nicer for copying the footage off quickly. So I could put both those cards in and use that to dual record for redundancy. For me it's not super critical, but say you're recording someone's wedding, you do not want to go to that couple and say, oh yeah sorry but my SD card broke, I've lost all your footage. So being able to dual record is quite important. So yeah, it's nice to have that there. So now finally, let's turn it on. The battery is quite low, it's, well, it's not actually even registering on that, so we'll see if it actually works. If not, I might actually charge it before we use it, but let's turn it on. Oh, here's some sort of stuff clicking inside, and yep, the screen's on. So, I need to set the date and the time zone, so set. All right, I'll need to set the clock. Um, I'll go and do that off camera, and I'll come back once I've gone through a setup, because it's probably just basic stuff. And now I'm back. So I've been away, used the camera to film one full video that I've since released, which is the UDM teardown, and I filmed another video, at least partially, that's kind of in the works. So I've got a good bit of experience with it, and I'm so glad I've gone with this camera over another mirrorless. It's just so convenient having one camera that I can just have an all-in-one device that does everything, both the video and the audio. I no longer need the separate camera and then the separate audio recorder and cables and stuff that I need to carry around, which is just fiddly. So I'm so happy with that. The picture quality is also really good. It's a super sharp picture. The lens seems really good. It's I've had no issues with that at all. The colours are decent. Can't really complain. And now, as I mentioned earlier, because this has a smaller sensor, it doesn't really do the shallow depth of field that a lot of mirrorless and DSLRs do, which might not be as good for certain more cinematic type stuff. But for what I do, it actually works really well because it means I don't need to worry about trying to keep things in focus. As long as it autofocus is okay, chances are the whole thing will be in shot, in focus. And if I do need to do shallow depth of field, it is possible. I just have to move the camera back really far and zoom in and then that kind of achieves the same effect. So definitely very happy with it and that's absolutely fine. Also having the motorized zoom works really well. If you watch my UDM video, you'll see me doing that where I'm like zooming into components and then zooming out again. It's just really nice and it's much easier than trying to use like the, the, the zoom ring on this lens here that's not very good and it doesn't really do that smooth zooming. So yeah, definitely very happy with it. The only thing I would say is the low light performance isn't amazing. In my setup here, it's absolutely fine because I've got big studio lights, so there's no problem there at all. If you're filming in a normal room, it's okay, but you might find it gets a little bit dark, especially if you zoom in because that increases the aperture of the lens, the picture will get a bit darker and then that might not be ideal. What I ended up doing on this is I ended up, there's a setting in the menu that lets you set a gain limit for the auto gain. By default that sets something like 30 decibels, which at that point it's really really noisy. So I dropped that down to about 12 decibels or minus 12 decibels, I can't remember which scale it uses. But I've dropped it down to, my, to 12 decibel and that really helps because at 12 decibels, the noise is bearable. So that means if you're doing something like zooming in and it's going to get a bit dark, the picture will noticeably come, become darker on the preview and you'll know to increase the light. Whereas if you've got it set to the standard auto setting, you run the risk of filming in too low light, the camera boosting the gain massively high, getting a really noisy picture, which will look perfectly bright on the, on the LCD, but then when you start editing it, you'll realise it's really noisy. But yeah, low light performance isn't great. Fine outdoors, fine under studio lighting, but you'd maybe want to be a little bit careful if you're just filming indoors without studio lighting, especially if you're going to be doing things like zooming in because that can be a little bit dark. But for me, that's absolutely fine. The other thing to talk about is the audio quality and the audio inputs. So as I mentioned, one of the reasons I bought this camera was that I could then connect my XLR microphone directly into it and not need the external audio recorder. And that works really well. On the side here, you've got two XLR connections. I'm just using one of them. And then what I do is I plug my camera into there, or my microphone into there, sorry. And then it's got this shotgun mic holder that's obviously designed to hold a shotgun mic or other types of mics. But what I actually do with mine is my lav mic has this big stupid XLR plug on it. You can put a AA battery in here if you're not using phantom power. So what I do is I've ended up mounting that into the camera, into the shotgun holder, looping the cable around, and it kind of holds the whole thing into one device. So it means I can even walk around with the camera handheld with my lav mic connected, and not have external cables and devices hanging off the camera. It actually works quite well. On the side you then have the two controls. There's this little flap here that lifts up and it's pretty easy to use. 
essentially you've got your two audio channels that will record and you can pick what device, what microphones go to what channel. So you can say that may either make them both use the internal microphone left and right for stereo or what I've got here where I record the internal microphone, the left channel of the internal microphone onto channel one and I record my external microphone on channel two. And that then means that if I do need audio from in front of the camera or my microphone fails and I've got a backup track, it just means I've got both recorded. For the internal mic, I just use the auto gain control. And for the external mic, I switch that down to the manual gain control and set a gain level here. And this is something I would say that's a little bit tricky. It's just something to bear in mind. The preamp noise isn't amazing. It's not dreadful, but the preamps are slightly noisy. Essentially what I found is there was a slight constant background hiss and it's really round about the same level until you start increasing the gain to probably the top two positions. At that point, it becomes a bit more noticeable. So round about here, you're kind of fine. You've just got that slight hiss. But I found if you go into the menu on the camera, go to audio, handle input settings, there's these mic levels. So for input to mic level, which is what I'm using for the external mic, you can go into there and it's got three different settings. By default, it's set to minus 50 decibels. Minus 60 is much louder, but has much more noise. Minus 40 decibels has slightly less noise. It's not much, but it's a little bit less. So if you can set it to that and still get decent volume out of your microphone without having to turn this up too high, then that might be worth doing it because, because that helped the noise quite a bit. Now, my microphone has quite a weak output. So if I set that to minus 40 decibels, I had to crank this right up to the maximum to get a decent enough level. And then that added more noise and it was kind of equal to using this with minus 50 decibels. However, because of my previous Tascam recorder also having quite noisy preamps, I already had a Fethead Phantom. It's this little preamp here. So using the Fethead Phantom with this camera, plugging that in, setting this to minus 40 decibels, I could then set this gain to a fairly low level and get probably the best signal I could get without much noise. And then the Fethead Phantom hangs neatly off the side of the camera, so it's absolutely fine. And with that, the noise is reasonably usable. I do still find that I need to have what's called an expander plugin, which just means when I'm not talking, when the level's quiet, it dips the gain slightly and reduces everything down quieter, just so you don't hear that hiss between me, between me speaking. But the good thing is that unlike the Tascam recorder that has quite a high pitched noise, which you can hear when I'm talking, the noise on this is quite low frequency. So when you're talking, you don't hear the noise. Whereas with the Tascam, you'd hear the noise even with your, when you're talking. And it meant I had to use noise reduction plugins that were really quite annoying and they did impact the other sound quality. So yeah, the preamps are okay, but they are a little bit noisy. It's fine for most stuff you'll be doing, but potentially, I don't know if you're doing like, I don't know, ASMR stuff or like super quiet wildlife photography where you need to hear like the rustles of leaves and you've got, you know, really, really quiet sounds. You might find them being a little bit too noisy. But for the average stuff you're going to use this camera for, you know, people talking to the camera, outdoor stuff, the preamps are fine. And yeah, again, just having this built in is so convenient. Like... I could not go back to having to deal with a separate audio recorder again. Like, I'm having to do that right now to record this piece, and it's annoying. So yeah, audio isn't the best I've ever heard, but it's absolutely fine for what I'm doing here. And obviously, if you're interested in hearing the audio quality, if you check out my previous video, you'll hear the audio from my Sony ECM-77B microphone recorded directly into this. Another thing I noticed that's quite a fun aside is that this camera also has a fan. There's literally a cooling fan in here that like, I think it sucks air in the back here and blows out the front here, or vice versa. There's actually like grills on it and a fan inside that you can hear when it runs. Now the fan is perfectly quiet. You won't hear it in any recordings. It's basically silent unless you put your head up to it. Like it's, it's no worse than like a hard drive in an old hard drive camcorder or like a tape in an old tape camcorder. You barely hear it. I just find it quite a novelty that it's obviously powerful enough that it has a cooling fan. But honestly, this is something that I'm really glad it has. Because with this current Sony camera, it overheats constantly. It's a black camera, it sits under bright lights, which means it gets hot naturally. I mean, you record for long periods of time, it starts flashing up a little temperature warning on the screen, and sometimes will shut off during recordings, and then you can't actually record again until it's cooled down. There's even been times where I've, I think especially during the MacBook Pro video, where I needed to get the video out that night, I was filming really, really quickly in constant, you know, constant big chunks of recording, 
and the camera started overheating to the extent I ended up putting it, on the, putting it outside on a windowsill to cool down because I was like, I needed it to cool down so I could continue filming. So having a camera that's got a fan in it just to keep it cool will just be so useful. Just It just removes the worry of the camera overheating. Whereas this current one, I'm constantly just checking the screen for that temperature warning light coming on because once it does, the camera's going to start having problems. Yeah. Just, just a bit of a random aside, but yeah, I was definitely not expecting to buy a camera that had a built-in cooling fan at this price point. So now on top of that, let's talk about the usability of the camera. So you've got the screen on the side here. This is really, really good. It's really bright, really adjustable, and it's a capacitive touchscreen. On the back, you've got this viewfinder, which is off by default, but when you pull it out, it'll turn on, and then you can angle it up and down if you want to sort of kind of look down into it. And then on the side there, there's an adjustment that lets you adjust the focus. Now I will say the viewfinder is a little bit disappointing. It's bearable, but what I would say is it is quite small in the sense that when you look into it, it looks like you're looking at quite a small screen from fairly far away. So whereas on my current camera, if I look at the viewfinder, I get a really big picture to see, I can see and I can really clearly see the focus. With this, I almost find it easier to see more detail on the LCD than using the viewfinder. So the viewfinder is nice to have, especially in bright sunlight where the, where the LCD is not working or whatever, but it's... It's not amazing, It's like the picture is just a little bit too small for me, but it's fine. You've got the, in terms of controls, you've got an absolute ton of them. You've got a record button here and a zoom adjustment here for the power zoom. Then you've also got the same thing mirrored up on the handle, which is really useful because if you're holding the camera like this, which I was using doing the other day, having the record button there is really handy. Additionally, you've got the light. Now, when I first saw that, I thought, that is an absolute gimmick. You know, it took me back to the days of having an old Sony Handycam that had a built-in light that I'm pretty sure might have been, even been like an incandescent bulb or like a very early LED. I didn't think it would be that useful. But actually, it is. Now, you need to be kind of careful with it because it is a light mounted directly on top of the camera. So whereas right now I'm filming with two lights off to the side, which gives you quite a nice sort of like shot with lots of shadows in it and stuff and gets quite a decent effect. When you're filming with a light directly on top of the camera, it's very directional and you don't see many shadows and it's very flat lighting. But if you're, say, filming just under fairly low light, it's maybe a bit duller overcast and you just want a little bit more light, or you're just in a situation where you just need light in a pinch, this is actually really useful. It's incredibly bright. The colour temperature seems to be around 4,500 Kelvin, just because I'm using it right now, and I can't really see a difference to my studio lights that are 4,500 Kelvin. So it's a decent enough sort of middle brightness or middle colour temperature. And I've actually found this being quite useful because I was filming a video in a sort of cupboard where I had to kind of get in and it was a little bit dark and I didn't really need to do a super long shot or do anything particularly fancy. I just needed to show something. So being able to just quickly turn this light on and use it to show inside the cupboard without having to drag my studio lights through was really, really useful. So yeah, maybe not the most useful thing in the world, but it's definitely nice to have and it's more effective than like a little gimmick. It is actually somewhat useful. It's, it's probably similar to maybe having like a LED panel on top of the camera. Maybe not as bright, but the good thing is, it's always here. The final thing I want to talk about is the controls. They're absolutely fine, but this camera does take quite a lot of learning. It's got quite a steep learning curve to figure it all out. You've got a bunch of buttons all over it, it's all around here, and I talked about them earlier, where you've got the user buttons that are programmable by the user. They're easy enough to set up in the menu. You can go into the menu, camera, user switch, and in here you can pick all the user buttons and the actions that they perform. So I've customised them a little bit, and I've done things, for example, where user 1 will pick a focus area, so I can pick, a, pick an area to do the autofocus on, which is really useful for the sort of stuff I do. And then user 2 means that if I put this into manual focus mode, using the button on the lens, which is how it is standard, you put the camera into full manual to do that, and then you can do that. This user 2 button will then do a one-time autofocus which is also quite good. If I'm doing sort of cer certain things where I don't want the camera just focusing constantly, I can do that and have like a one-time autofocus. So having the ability to program these buttons is super useful because I can kind of customize the camera to what I'm needing to do rather than what like Panasonic thought I needed to do. The other thing to take a look at is the menu system. And this is where this camera is a little bit fiddly and it's maybe not my favorite. And that is that the menu system is a little bit fiddly and clunky. To access the menu, there's a button on the side, you press menu. And what they've clearly tried to do is make this menu suitable with physical con controls and touchscreen. So there's this little dial here that rotates and clicks in. And if you scroll that, it scrolls up and down the menu. You can go up, you can click it in, and it navigates you through the menu. 
And if you scroll in there, it'll scroll through all the options and then it'll just keep scrolling down to different pages of options. And that's absolutely fine. But it's also touchscreen. But what I've found with the touchscreen is that it's perfectly responsive enough, it's sensitive enough, but there's a couple of little quirks you need to get over. And that is, first of all, that it doesn't respond to quick taps. You kind of need to hold on the option a little bit for it to respond. Which I think is an intentional decision to make it not e make it easy so that you don't accidentally bump it. But it does take a little bit, a little bit of getting used to because otherwise you think it's not responding. The only other thing I found that's a little bit annoying is that on a menu like this, there's multiple pages of options. And just because I'm used to smartphones, I sort of instinctively try and drag up like that and it doesn't do it. What you need to do is use these buttons here to like navigate down through the pages of options. So it's fine, it just takes a little bit of getting used to. And then the only, only other thing in here is just there's a lot of options and it's just a little bit fiddly. It's things like, for example, if you've got it in manual mode and you want to do like an auto white balance, by default it won't do that. The white balance button will cycle through like a couple of different white balance presets, including one that lets you like manually set it. But if you want to make it do auto white balance, you have to go into the menu, go into camera settings, software mode, I think that is, ATW, pick either A channel or B channel, don't know what that means, and then now if you've input it into manual mode, your white balance can then go between auto white balance, which is what that is, ATW, or like a white balance figure that I can change. So there's just a few things there, I'm not going to go into a full tutorial of how it all works, but there's a few things there where I found I've had to change a lot of settings and customise it to get certain features I want, such as tap to focus or auto white balance when the camera's in manual mode. Once you figure all that sort of stuff out, it's absolutely fine, but it's just got quite a steep learning curve to figure all that sort of stuff out. Similar deal with the codex as well, actually. Not going to go into too much detail again, but if you go into system, because they're under system for some reason, and record format, there's a lot of different options here that are very, very jargony. So I'm currently recording in 2160, 50p, HVEC, long GOP, 200M, which is essentially 200 megabytes a second, or 200 megabit a second, HEVC, 4K, 50 frames a second. Which is fine once you know that, but yeah, there's a little bit of jargony, a little bit of jargony in here. I find myself having checked the manual quite a lot, whereas when I came into this, I was maybe a bit overconfident, thinking, oh, I can work a mirrorless, I can easily work a camcorder. I'm just like, yeah, there's a few things with this that just take a little bit of learning, but yeah, once you figure it out, it's absolutely fine. So there you go, that was a look at my new camcorder, which is the Panasonic HCX1500 with the optional top handle. And I am so happy with it. I'm so glad that I went for this over a mirrorless. It's just so convenient having an all-in-one device that I can connect the microphone to. It just works out of the box and it is truly point and shoot. I mean, admittedly, with a lot of settings to change, but once you've got it all set up, I can just take this, grab it, hit record, and know that I'll get good results. Whereas with this current camera, I'm always having focus issues and just it's just a bit fiddly. And then the separate audio recorder is a pain. So it is just really, really good. Now, obviously, I've not gone into all the details showing exactly how it all works and doing a full tutorial, partially because I don't I don't even know how half this stuff works yet. I've not gone into full detail on it. I don't know all the features this has. And also, there's a lot of better videos out there. There's also a lot of better example videos that people have put out that show this in a lot of different settings. But yeah, if you're interested in checking out the quality that I've been able to get for it, as I mentioned before, check out my previous video. Or if you're watching this a bit later, check out some future videos. But yeah, I'm so happy with this camera and I can't wait to produce more videos with it. Especially now that I'm using the old setup again, I'm really, really missing this. So yeah, there you go. Bit of fun, but you know, bit of big change for the channel finally going to 4K. And I can't wait to produce more 4K content. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. And if you're interested in buying this camera, there's links in the description.